welcome to the County Board Wrap-Up. I'm your host, Kara O'Donnell, and today we'll be discussing some of the key actions the County Board took at its June meeting. Decisions that affect you, your neighborhood, and our community. We're joined today, as always, by County Board Chair Jay Fissette, and joining us also today is Board Member Christian Dor Dorsey. Jay and Christian, thanks for joining us today. Let's start off with some climate action. The Board took a resolution uh, made a resolution at the June meeting um, on climate action. Let's talk about why this was necessary. Yeah. Well, it's a few weeks ago that the world was stunned, maybe surprised, maybe not, by the action of the president to abdicate uh, his responsibility and the federal government responsibility on addressing uh, climate change. Um, we were part of the Paris Accord, uh, and now we've joined just one or two other nations. Is it Nicaragua and North Korea or something yeah, and like Nicaragua that. Nicaragua and, and one Syria, of them is Syria. Syria that's Nicaragua right. and Syria. And Nicaragua didn't sign because they wanted to do more, more right. not it wasn't, less. It wasn't so, I mean, the bottom line is that um, we now recognize, as do many other localities, many cities, many states, that the, the ball is in our court um, to tell the world um, that the United States of America and most of the people that live here get it. We still recognize the importance of this issue to the future of our planet, of our communities, of our country, um, so that there has been uh, outpouring across the country and we wanted to be part of that. We wanted to be part of that voice that says, we can't do it all alone, we know that, but we want to send a message to others that we're in this to fulfill our own community energy plan, which we created four, four years ago, three, four years ago, with the business community, with the community at large, that set goals and targets for us to be part of solving the biggest sort of moral and real issue the planet faces over the next generation. So this was a statement by the board, an important policy statement, and we plan to you know, dig in and continue to implement as robustly as we can um, the elements of our community energy plan. Now this doesn't mean we're changing our plan in any way, does it? It's just kind of reaffirming that we have a plan, we are committed to there this. Been, there were no changes in policy made with this statement. It was a, a political policy statement that reaffirmed our commitment. And I think it's fair to say that um, this community um, has always been behind this effort. Um, I am hoping that with the actions of the federal government, we'll actually see an enhanced effort because without the federal government there meeting some of our targets will be harder. Um, we actually took an action in the last budget cycle to put some more uh, modest funding in there through the residential utility tax. This effort in Arlington has a dedicated funding source through the residential utility tax which will allow us to take some additional steps beyond what we've been doing in the past. Do you feel like any of those funding sources because of the federal administration's action, could any of that be in jeopardy as a result of this action, or we can No, no, no. We, we don't get federal money to okay. handle uh, this kind of an issue. Um, so this doesn't put us in, in conflict with the federal government in terms of being punished by them. It puts us in conflict in terms of the statement of this locality and many, many others. Uh, in terms of what our goals and intentions are. And I was going to say, this is a trend that's happening not just here in Arlington or even across yeah. the region. This is happening in communities all over the nation, correct? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, our governor has, uh, has been outspoken in this regard. You know, it, it's kind of funny. It seems like the federal government is really at odds with the nation. If you consider, you know, states and localities and their voices, it's our federal government that's the outlier. So I think it'll be... A, a real challenge for you know the administration to figure out how it, it is not really reflecting what are clear locally driven community values and and Mr. Fazette's being really really modest about his role in making sure Arlington uh, has long been a leader in this regard part of the reason that we didn't have to change anything or you know move policy in a different direction was the forward thinking of of Mr. Fazette and prior boards to put us in a place where you know we can reaffirm our commitment and we can continue to do things like we're trying to do in 2017 trying to break new ground in the commonwealth on commercial properties and getting them to be more energy efficient so you know i'm i'm, I'm really happy to be a part of a community where we could simply after the president's action simply reaffirm what makes us unique and the goals in this community energy plan are about energy reliability about the economy of our community and of our state, 
I mean, let's face it, it is so short-sighted to remove the United States from the Paris Accord when the future and the industries and the jobs of the future are around clean energy. Mm -hmm. It's not about coal anymore. Sure, there's going to be some coal, but the goal is for the environment and for the economy to move beyond that and be the creative force with the new technologies of clean energy in the future. So. Sadly, at the federal level, we're, we're really going backwards in many, in many regards. And a lot of those kind of old school, for lack of a better way of putting it, manufacturing plants and companies are now evolving themselves and really leading the way in the alternative energy space as Absolutely. well. So this is something I'm sure we're not going to see the end of Absolutely anytime not. soon. <clears throat> So kind of switching gears a little bit, but on the same vein, from forward thinking in climate change to forward thinking in planning. The county received some very significant awards for its planning. Let's talk a little bit about that. Sure, and I think you're right to connect the two because, you know, climate change and the environment is about thinking long term. And so have we just gotten an award because of the history in Arlington in planning. That's what we do. Mm -hmm. Plan, plan, plan. And we do it really well compared to most. So we were given a very prestigious award by the American Planning Association, uh, essentially for our general land use plan and our smart growth journey. Um, it's kind which, of a lifetime achievement award. It, it, that, that's a great way to put it, it and it really like is. <laughs> it's at least over several decades where we have just excelled um, and each of us that comes into this job learns from the past and truly really tries to you know, build on that planning um, tradition. Uh, refining the plans as we go along to uh, take into account new and better and, and more contemporary approaches to some of the problems and some of the newer problems. So it was really nice to have the APA. They came to the board meeting. They had uh, congratulated our staff as well because our planning staff deserves an enormous amount of credit for helping train us and guide us and partner with us to, to do a lot of great things in Arlington. Was there anything the APA specifically called out when recognizing Arlington for this award? You know, any specific milestones or things that are on the horizon? Well, I mean, I think they really, uh, you know, you, if you look at our smart growth principles illustrated by our, our metro, and I mean, you know, heavy rail urban villages, I think that was a key call out for what we've been able to do and, uh, you know, how that's not only allowed us to develop around metro stations, but how we've applied those principles elsewhere throughout the county to really manage growth in a way that's pretty unique in suburban communities. And uh, I'd say it's that transformation uh, over several decades from what some would have called a suburban <laughs> place, uh, car oriented, to a transformation to an urban community mm -hmm. and having an enormous amount of commercial and high rise um, uh, multifamily residential not so much on the single family. It's only a 4% increase in single family homes in the last 20 years because all that growth that we've had is in places where you want it, connected to the rail system, the, cor the metro corridor and other transportation. So we've protected our residential neighborhoods. They've remained residential. Maybe they got McMansions and <laughs> tree issues, you know, because of those McMansions, but by and large, it hasn't been rezoned. It's stayed residential. But that development, and uh, one thing they called out, if I remember, is the mixed-use commercial residential has allowed us to have a tax base that is yeah, essentially 50% yeah. reliant in the real estate tax on commercial and 50% on residential, which is an enormous uh, savings for the taxpayer here to be able to have that high a percentage of the money that comes in to provide services to everyone coming from the commercial sector. It's 50% for us, and in most communities, it's closer to 15 to 20%. Yeah, right. absolutely. So that's a true benefit to the residents. And that's something Arlington has been lauded for, not just by the APA, but by organizations sure. nationwide mm -hmm. for years, because sure. we're very unique in that regard. Yep, very unique. I know Prince William, Loudon, Fairfax are all pretty envious of that. It's a good problem to have. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, well, we're going to take a short break right now, but when we come back, we're going to talk about Metro's long-term plan to keep it safe, reliable, and affordable. Stay with us.
Welcome back to County Board Wrap Up. I'm your host, Kara O'Donnell, and we're chatting with Board Chair Jay Fassett and Board Member Christian Dorsey about the June board meeting. Now, let's talk about the issue that a lot of folks have been talking about for the last year. Metro has officially ended its Safe Track program. That's right. But now we move into a whole new phase, correct? That's right. I, and, you know, once you think about where Metro was, a state of chaos, disrepair, and not really understanding the full uh, depth of, of all of the concerns, there was this immediate effort to, to just stabilize the patient. And I think we're at that place, and now we think about how do we recuperate, how do we rehabilitate, and at the same time, how do we woo back customers who abandon the system uh, due to our telling them that, listen, you know, for a while, if you have other options, we encourage you to pursue them. But now we've gotten to a, a stable place and, and we want you back. And I think uh, we were very fortunate to have the Metro General Manager come and talk through uh, what that plan is and what that will mean for Arlington as a contributing jurisdiction to the Metro system. And uh, I get the benefit of, of having these conversations frequently and I'm, I'm really glad that my colleagues got to hear firsthand uh, from the General Manager uh, about what, what is a very thoughtful and uh, what has been a very well thought out for a long time plan to move Metro forward. But the kind of the recovery is not complete as of yet. The patient may be stabilized, but the recovery is not complete. The new schedule that rolled out mm -hmm. does include some service cuts in the form of time between trains, yes, yes. as well as some fare increases, right. 10 to 25 cents yes. on average. <laughs> It, that is a temporary situation. Well, the the fare cuts are. Par, uh, the, I'm sorry. The the fare the increases are part of you know what you do from time to time sure. with transit agencies. Metro hadn't raised fares in three years. Uh, it, it's board policy to to revisit fares every two. Uh, so that is something that even though no one loves to either enact it or loves to pay it. It's something that's a necessary part of every transit system's experience. Now, the service is something that. Uh, it was very challenging for the GM to propose and for the board to, uh, to adopt. And I'll just tell you briefly, Kara, why it had to be done. Uh, for years, Metro had prioritized service over maintenance. And that's really what led to Safe Track, mm -hmm. was that you didn't have enough time to maintain your system. And as Metro was relatively young, that didn't become immediately obvious to people. It's fairly shiny, it's fairly new, things didn't break down quite as much. But as that service increased... Right. Longer service into the late night, yeah. starting earlier, that didn't leave much time to actually get in those tunnels That's and right. do work. That's right. right. So, I mean, real. this is not rocket science. Right. This is a fundamental problem. Right. And uh, since there was no plan to really figure out how you were going to do that maintenance while you expanded service, the maintenance went away and the system eroded. And that led us to where we were. So these service changes in terms of hours are designed to get get to the point where we don't have to do safe track 2.0 and then the reductions in service you can certainly look at it that way as a service cut but at the same time for years what customers told us and what was very apparent from the data was that Metro rarely delivered the level of service it was promising so by changing the service intervals to really match what you think you can deliver I hope we'll at least restore some faith that Metro can actually do what it says it wants to do you know, and I'll say, when we had the GM, the Metro GM, uh, Paul Wiedefeld, come to the board meeting in June, he did an excellent presentation, and he's out talking to a lot of people because he has gained an enormous amount of credibility um, in trying to ensure safety and reliability, as Christian's just been talking about. There is another issue, though. I mean, and, and before you can tackle the long-range sustainability, he needed to show that he had his, his eye on the prize, he understood the situation, he was willing to take difficult decisions like safe track, mm -hmm. like laying off a whole bunch of, of or, or chopping positions, becoming more efficient, uh, responding to the community. But the real issue for the future of Metro, which means the future of the region, is a new dedicated funding mm -hmm. source. There is no dedicated funding source that Metro can rely on, and it's one of the only, if not the only, major transit system in America with that. And I've been there's here long there's enough. There's only one other. Uh, which is the other one? New Jersey Transit, which is not even apples to apples right. in terms it's of comparison. Of well, and I've been here long enough to know that we've done study after study that acknowledge this issue 
and then punted, tried to find another way carving up the pie. Mm. It didn't work. We have to find a new dedicated funding stream or streams for Metro by next year. And the reason is because the local governments, one, they need more money, but the local governments here cannot pay the increases that would be falling to us without that new funding source. And that the was tax something payers, we talked about during the budget seat. We right. had to raise the tax, right. pay, uh, tax rate one full penny, which was because of the increase in Metro. We're putting in about 70 plus million mm -hmm. a year in operating and capital to Metro. That's an, and in Virginia, that falls to the Arlington residents. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In Maryland, it's the state that covers right. it. In Virginia, it's the local arms. We have to do it. We have to come together, the two legislatures, Maryland, Virginia, the District of Columbia, the federal government, we have to come to agreement. And there is a time pressure on this. Otherwise, the problems will get worse with the system and the local governments and the other governments will have a huge uh, tax burden to come up with. Because the real consequence is if we don't find the solution, we're back to where we were before Safe Track, yeah. where Metro uh, you know, chooses to pay for certain things, skates by on other things, and you know, this region would just, it would be, it would be a dereliction of all of our duties if we allowed the immediate mistakes that are so clear in our rear rear mirror to be replicated again. Yeah. And uh, you know, as Jay said, the solution is there, it's always been there. Yeah. Uh, hopefully it's the political will it's that's political caught up. Will. That's right, and if it doesn't get fixed, uh, the region, Arlington will suffer, mm -hmm. the region the will suffer, regions. the economy will suffer, and there are many dominoes that will fall after that. So where the dis do the discussions stand at this point? Does it look like yeah. there's a light at the end of the tunnel on this? I'm optimistic. A couple of lights at the moment. <laughs> We're trying to narrow the lights. Right? I'm optimistic. <laughs> you know, we've got, what's great is no one disputes the problem. Yeah. No one dis disputes the scale of the solution that is required. Mm -hmm. No one disputes that the fundamental mechanism of dedicated financing right. is necessary. And Paul Wiedefeld has been great helping to frame that. That's right. He really has. Now there's quibbling about the details, which I guess in our region is always going to be a part of any exercise in getting from problem to solution. But I'm optimistic because we are quibbling about the details, not the fundamental yeah. framing values. And to me, if you've got uh, essential understanding and agreement on that, everything else can fall the into The alternatives place. are becoming unpalatable for right. most, but you know, it specifically gets down to what the funding source is and the process for doing it in the sales. Regional sales tax is one that is a very attractive option to many, and then there's the alternative of letting these two states in the district come up with their own proportional amount and figuring it out independently. So this is an issue that's going to face the General Assembly in Virginia and the, the legislature in Maryland and probably a lot of focus is on the Virginia General Assembly. Uh, and hopefully by next year, when they meet January, February, March, we will have a solution. But that's, that's the timeline. Okay, well, well, from an issue that's kind of hard to reach consensus to one that everybody, I think, is pretty unified on, and that is the great American pastime of baseball. Arlington's own Tucker Field is getting some real benefit from a unique public-private partnership. Let's talk a little bit about that. Yes, this is a, down in my neighborhood. Uh, George Washington University uh, operates uh, Tucker Field. It's their collegiate level baseball diamond and, and ancillary uh, practice and clubhouse facilities down in Barcroft Park. Um, it is a wonderful example of a public private partnership where GW has uh, you know, paid for the installation of this collegiate level diamond. And now we are going to have them invest in new facilities to cover batting cages and, and renovate a clubhouse. The best part, the public can use it when GW's That's not great. using it. So, you know, you've got the college baseball team which has its need to use it during certain times of the year, but when they're not, it's open to Arlington uh, yeah. adult league players, uh, little league players, Babe Ruth, softball, or I guess softball can use the batting cages. Uh, so this is a, a great example of how you know, when you have limited space, you can work creatively with, with partners to provide wonderful community amenities. Yeah. And we're seeing a lot, of, a lot more of this kind of public-private partnership type thing, and it really it seems like a win-win for 
the whole situation. It really is, and it's, it's one of the best things. When you deal with yeah. Metro, it's hard. <laughs> you got to roll up your sleeves, and, and this, it's kind of like, wow, we get to it's just uh, you know ride, ride this to glory. Hey, Public-private partnerships can be great. I mean, they, they can be a win-win. You always have to be careful, you know, when you're part of the public, but, you know, look at uh, the Capitals Ice Skating Rink. You know, exactly. look at Signature yeah. Theater. Yeah. Um, this is just another one in the long line of really highly visible but really productive partnerships that we've created. And I think it's great that Arlington has partners with colleges and universities and, and artistic groups like Signature and you know people who are not looking to fleece us out of public assets but are really looking for that Enhanced. somewhat mission-driven you know, collaborative approach to yeah. the win-win. Mm -hmm. All right, well, we're going to take a short break now, but when we come back, we're talking streets and bridges. Stay with us. Welcome back to today's final segment of County Board Wrap Up. With us, we have Board Chair Jay Fassett and Board Member Christian Dorsey. And we had a nice update to the Williamsburg Conservation Plan this month. Give me the details on that. Sure, they came before the board and uh, we have, oh, I'd say 40 different neighborhood conservation plans that have come through the neighborhoods. And as we all know, it's a very unique program where the neighborhoods are work together to create their vision for their neighborhood. What do they want to see down the road? What improvements? What enhancements? Uh, they work with staff. They create a picture of what they want their community to look like. Um, now, when it comes to the board, it's not that we adopt it and we say everything will come true, <laughs> but we accept it as an, an incredible body of work um, that they've put together. And the other advantage of this program is that they get to work together. They get to know each other. It's a community building exercise, honestly. Even when there's tension, it all works towards a positive outcome. So Williamsburg came to us, I think it was their first update after submitting their original uh, neighborhood conservation plan a couple decades ago. And it's a, a very good, strong, solid um, improvement on what they had. So um, this is a north, uh, part of the county up uh, north of East Falls Church. Mm -hmm. Uh, Minor Hill is sort of one of the, the destination uh, identifications up there, and they came to us with a whole lot of good ideas about what could make their, their neighborhood even better. Okay, and they really have the buy-in because it comes from that grassroots community building. Now they're process. eligible for some neighborhood conservation bond funding. They'll get in the queue, they'll prioritize their projects, and hopefully, uh, one at a time, some of these improvements will happen. Great. And then, of course, the other type, we have, you know, street maintenance. It's never a sexy topic, but it is a necessary topic. Um, and the board did approve several contracts for some projects here. So what are some of the details that uh, what residents can expect? I'll tell you, it may not be sexy, but it excites me, Kara. <laughs> uh, you know, this is about what, what delivering a, a great community is for a lot of people. It's when, uh, you know, trails connect and they're safe to cross and where bridges are uh, not in a state of disrepair. And, you know, we had a number of contracts that we awarded to provide some of those improvements uh, down on the Washington and Old Dominion Trail around the Four Mile Run area. We have some pretty, uh, you know, bizarre pedestrian crossings that are not necessarily as safe as they could be. Uh, so there are improvements there. There are some gerb and gutter, gutter improvements uh, that are going to be done uh, elsewhere in uh, Roslyn, and then we've got some Custis Trail improvements, and then a variety of bridge crossings in the, the Roslyn area between Roslyn and Courthouse, which are just going to make those uh, a little bit safer uh, for pedestrians to, to use. And yeah, on their own, none of these are things that are going to make the news. Boy, that just doesn't sound really <laughs> exciting. You got excited about that, huh? But he's, on, he's very excited. But collectively, collectively, when people wake up and they say, my community works, yeah. These are among the things, even if they're yeah. not top of mind, right. this is what they're thinking of. And this is kind of part of an overall effort for pedestrian safety, isn't Absolutely. It? Which is always a good thing. It, what's keep, it's what keeps the county going. I mean, yeah. honestly, the, those construction, those projects, those investments, whether it's a park upgrade or an intersection, they are happening all the time. Yeah. And we have to prioritize them, and that is what keeps this 
kind of vibrant and you know keep it moving forward. And we have more and more people using these trails and therefore these crossings. Oh, yeah. That's so right. we we need to If you're on that trail, on you know. That's yes, right. yes, I'm aware. So, all right. Well, thank you very much, gentlemen, and that brings us to the end of another county board wrap up. Thank you Jay and Christian for joining us today to shed some light on those decisions that the board took at its June meeting. We hope you enjoyed this chat with the board members. And remember, all county board meetings are open to the public. You can find the schedule and information on speaking at a board meeting on our website, arlingtonva.us. To learn how you can get involved or make yourself heard on the issues, visit topics.arlingtonva.us slash engage on the county website. That's our civic engagement page. And that's where you can share your ideas and learn how to get involved in the county issues. We'll see you next month.